Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by Tower Electronics. For connectors, cables, and more, call 920-435-2973 or visit pl-259.com. And by ICOM. Heard it? Worked it? Logged it. Visit www.icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information about ICOM radios. It's Ham Radio. Good evening, everyone, from the frigid ice palace of Echo Mike 69. It's Ham Talk Live, episode number 151, Eris Update, recorded live on Thursday, January 31st, 2019. I'm your host, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Ham Talk Live. Tonight, we're joined by Frank Bauer. KA3HDO, and we'll take your calls live in just a few minutes. Last week here on the show, Michael Colley, W4MCA, was here to talk about hamcation. If you missed the show, you can listen anytime at hamtalklive.com or on your favorite podcast app or YouTube, or you can catch the rebroadcast on WTWW 5085 AM. Saturday evenings at about 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So get your Eris questions ready to go. If you're listening to us on Thursday night, you can give us a call after the interview by telephone. And we're back on our backup number again. So let me give you that number. And uh, we still haven't been able to get that number switched over yet. We're still waiting on Skype. So... The number for calling in tonight will be 812-650-9556. Again, 812-650-9556 is the number to call when we get to that point. We're not uh, there yet, but we will be. And you can also tweet a question. In fact, we already have three uh, coming in on Twitter tonight. Our Twitter handle is at HamTalkLive, so we'll be looking for for that and uh, we'll be back with frank right after this word from tower electronics right here on ham talk live thank you for a lovely dinner aren't you going to ask me in to solder some pl 259s well i do have some from tower electronics how can i refuse consider the sophisticated quality of pl 259s from tower electronics from soldering supplies to adapters connectors to cables, and all types of connectors. Tower Electronics has the parts you're looking for. Well? Just one more connector? You know I love your PL259s. Then by all means, take some with you. Don't be caught without PL259s. Visit Tower Electronics at a ham fest near you. Or visit them online anytime at pl-259.com. Or call 920-435-2973. They also have ham sticks, mobile antennas, and meters, too. See the whole catalog. Go to pl-259.com. Tower Electronics, the ham's dime store since 1978. Here's the snap. Rap takes the rig. He breaks through the pileup. He's on 80. Now 40. Now 20. 15. 10. Two meters. Touchdown. Ham Talk Live. Thanks to Scott and Jill at Tower Electronics for bringing the show to you once again tonight. 
They'll be at Hamcation coming up February 8th, 9th, and 10th. Don't miss them there. And also, they'll be in Dalton, Georgia on February 23rd. And you can visit them anytime at pl-259.com. Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, has been licensed since 1974 and in 1983 in preparation for the first ever ham radio operation from space. He was responsible for setting up and operating the worldwide retransmission of space shuttle air-to-ground communications from the Goddard Amateur Radio Club station WA3NAN. This initiative provided a critical conduit of information to hams attempting to contact astronaut hams in the pre-internet era. Frank now serves as the amateur radio on the International Space Station International Chairman. Frank holds a bachelor's and master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from Purdue University, and his career in aerospace fans spans four decades within NASA and in the private industry. And he's the 2017 Dayton Hamvention <clears throat> Amateur of the Year. So, Frank, welcome back. Well, thank you, uh, Neil. It's uh, great to be back. Yeah, it's been a while since we've done an update here on some of the Ares plans and uh, wanted to talk a little bit about those. So thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, – come and talk to us a little bit about some of this and there's there's a lot going on so uh first off let's talk about the upgrades to the equipment on board the space station uh we've got uh, a new radio uh, project that's been going on and a uh, power supply for it and uh, and a new antenna going up so uh why don't you tell us all about that sure i can um <clears throat> actually we have we have seven different activities going on in the hardware world. Um, it's been uh, very in- interesting, but uh, the probably the most important one is our next generation radio system uh, that we're going to be flying. We call it the interoperable radio system because basically what we want to do is develop one. What we are doing is developing one system that can operate throughout space station. In other words, we'll have a uh, identical setup in the uh, Columbus module and an identical setup in the in the Russian service module. So that includes, as you said, uh, Neil, this um, multi-voltage power supply, which is um, a really cool device being uh, developed by Kerry Banke uh, and, of course, Lou McFadden, our, um, our chief engineer, um, in that it's going to allow us to um, use multiple voltages on space station and we have uh, multiple capabilities uh, that uh, will allow us to do, um, you know, uh, more on in the Columbus module than we could before, and substantial improvements uh, or um, enhancements for the future. So we can actually uh, plug in uh, four different systems at the same time. Um, uh, an important piece of that whole thing is, of course, the radio, which is the... Uh, the JVC Kenwood uh, D710GA uh, that uh, uh, we've worked with Kenwood to um, modify for flight. Um, and uh, I think uh, combined, um, the, those systems will provide a really outstanding platform uh, on both sides of, uh, of the space station, on the Russian and the U.S. side. And then um, uh, as a result, um, it'll be a lot easier for the crew to be able to uh, to get ready and do a contact. So all in all, I think it's going to be a phenomenal capability. So where are we on that right now? I know you've had some fundraising to do for that. Where are we on that right now? Yeah, right now, um, you know, the interesting part about this is we have to build 10 units. Um, if you think about it, we have to have two flight units. I talked about one in, in the... Uh, uh, Russians in the service module and one in the Columbus module. We need to have flight backups for each one of those. So that's four. Then we have to have training units for multiple areas in the, in the world, you know, United States, Russia, and, um, and then also, um, uh, you know, units to test and, and verify and things like that. So we are building 10 units. Um, the funding, I mean, we're spending a lot of money right now because the 
the parts that go along with this are not cheap. Um, we need to uh, take some extensive travel down at the NASA Johnson Space Center to do testing there. Um, literally, I have a whole bunch of emails today on, on uh, preparing for the, the uh, testing. We have to go through testing twice. We have to go through an engineering unit, uh, which we call a flight identical unit, which is built now. Um, and, um, and then once we've done that, we're going to do a subset of testing with the flight unit. And then the flight unit, both flight units, the flight unit, we're going to start with the uh, one in the Columbus module, and then uh, we'll do the one in the Russian service module. So that's all, um, you know, we're working towards trying to get this thing flown this year, if possible. So um, uh, we, you know, it's all a function of, you know, how the testing goes and, you know, getting through the, um, the uh, safety certification paperwork uh, and, and all of that, um, at proving to NASA and to Roscosmos, the Russian um, um, space agency, that our unit has uh, passed all the engineering and safety testing that verifies that it's ready for flight. And if people want to help out with that process, they can donate at? Yeah, best place uh, to do is just go to the ARIS website, www.aris.org, A-R-I-S-S.org. There's a donate button there, and um, we're, we're doing it uh, a couple different ways. Um, uh, we have a fundraiser campaign that's, that's part of that, and then we also have um, a, a donate button that will go right to the MSAT uh, um, PayPal. All of the money that goes into AMSAT for Eris goes directly to Eris, hundred percent. So um, um, basically, that's it's very simple. Just go to that donate button, and uh, and you should be able to do it. Okay, and then let's talk about this new uh, antenna going up in the Columbus module. Sure. So um, uh, the Europeans are going to be doing something similar to the Japanese have done. Um, they're uh, putting a system around the outside of the Columbus module so that they can put payloads on there. And so um, to do that, uh, some of the payloads they want to fly are some RF payloads too. And there's a feed-through that we're using right now um, that uh, um, has four... I, well, everyone in this that's listening here knows all about antenna ports and the importance of feed-throughs. Uh, there's a feed-through that has um, uh, the ability to put four pieces of coax through it, if you will. And there, we're only using two of them. We are, and AIS antennas using it. Um, they want to use all four, and to do that means they got to disconnect the current antenna that we have. So we've been working now um, with ESA and NASA to... Um, uh, get a new antenna, basically identical to what we have, um, installed uh, sometime late this year when this um, payload system called Bartolomeo gets launched. And so uh, uh, that's just another project uh, we're working on right now. We've got the antennas built, um, and ESA is supposed to be providing a clamp that uh, clamps the antenna to the to handrail, and then the feed line, the feed line, um, because they need to have a, uh, uh, you know, an EVA or, you know, extravehicular activity spacewalk um, connector, special connector on there so that the crew that's in a, in a spacesuit, they can actually install this. So, um, so ESA is provide ESA and NASA are providing that to us. And then, uh, uh, sometime late this year, we're going to be launching this antenna. It should not be a big, um, very visible, I'll say, to the ham radio community because the intent is to disconnect and connect back up in a couple days. Um, but uh, for us, it's a big deal in that we're going through all this safety certification for it as well as building it up and, uh, and putting on... You know, it's interesting because one of the more expensive parts of this is a special coating we got to put on the antenna. Um, the antenna, of course, needs to be s safe. So we put um, on the sharp, basically we got a measuring tape antenna, 
and the sharp edges of the me measuring tape, we put this Kapton tape on it. But the Kapton tape, if you put it outside for long periods of time, will deteriorate uh, because of atomic oxygen interaction. So we have to put this special coating of silicon di dioxide on it's vacuum impregnated to, to actually prevent that from happening. So we're doing all these things, and <laughs> these things are all expensive, if you will. So that's why why uh, we need we need uh, those donations I was talking about earlier. Yeah, anytime you have to go through, I've been through uh, inspection, and, and anytime you have to go through NASA inspection, um, it's going to take a while, and it's not going to be cheap. So <laughs> that's part of it. Uh, okay, we've got uh, a lot of uh, different modes going on. Let's talk a little bit about the... Uh, ham tv transmitter that's actually uh being worked on yeah so um that's another that's another i mentioned there's seven things um actually two of them are ham tv one of them is um we just uh, brought back um the ham tv unit uh, it it stopped we don't know why um and so um on the last spacex um dragon flight um we were we basically, it splashed down on the 13th of January, and so um, that is uh, coming back and will be tested to understand what the problems are. At the same time, uh, we are looking at a ham TV2 system. So if we can turn this around fast, uh, that's fantastic. But the other thing we are looking at is towards the future, and um, can we use... Uh, a higher resolution ham TV capability. Can we use it to um, actually transmit down high speed data that we might want to transmit down with some student experiments? So there's a number of things we're looking at relative to both the current ham TV system and then also ham TV too. So ham TV, you know, current system is back down. It, it will be several weeks before we get our hands you know, they've got a lot of unpacking to do and transport uh, back to us. We should be seeing it in another couple weeks from now. And then uh, uh, we'll start the debugging and try to understand whether we can quickly turn it around. And then the packet system, you've got some, uh, some equipment uh, up there. And uh, actually, we got a question in from... Uh, Luciana Gasparini, PT9KK in Brazil, and said there's some new equipment stowed on the ISS for APRS. Any chance that that'll happen in the next eight weeks? He's working on a dedicated eye gate in western Brazil uh, just for this. So uh, what's going on with the packet system? An APRS. Well, I thank him. I, first off, I want to thank him for doing that because uh, we can use all the the um, capabilities as possible. And I gate uh, dedicated eye gates a, a great thing to have. Um, so, so it's interesting. Uh, you know, before the beginning of the year, we were able to um, we call it up mass, basically launch a um, the, uh, one of our. Our packet modules, our, our, one of our spare packet modules that we had, uh, because the packet module uh, stopped working. It was intermittent for a while. And, um, and, and unfortunately, we had a little bit of a hiccup because um, you know what it's like when you lose your keys? Um, it, sometimes you, uh, it takes a little bit to find them, and then all of a sudden you find them. Um, well, <laughs> you know, when you're, when, when you're in... When you're in a microgravity environment, if you put something in a, one place, it doesn't always stay there. And unfortunately, that's what happened to our packet module. It went, it went missing for a little bit. Um, but what I can say is that uh, um, we found out about a week, within the past week, that, um, it, that it was um, rediscovered, I'll call it that. And um, we're being put on a list to get the packet module installed. So I don't know. I can't tell you for sure when that's going to happen, but I will say that um, if everything goes well and the packet module works as, as, as expected, um, I would say we should have it back up in the eight weeks uh, uh, that uh, was described. Okay, very good. 
Uh, and then you've got a Lime SDR experiment that's finishing up. So tell us a little bit about it. Yes, that's a uh, interesting experiment. Um, it's called Marconista. And that's, you know, like uh, Marconi ISSTA, if you will. Um, and actually, that, that, that word, Marconista, means radio amateur in Italian. So uh, Marconista was an experiment that was proposed by um, Martin Buescher, uh, who's a student at the Technical University of, Ber- of uh, Berlin. And uh, basically, it's a, like you said, it's a Lyme SDR. It's a, it's a radio spectrum experiment looking at the ham bands. And um, they've done some very interesting so basically what they're looking at is 2 meters, 70 centimeters, L-band, and S-band, the, the antennas we have on Space Station right now. And so um, they've already gotten some data, and, and, and Martin is using this. Actually, he's getting his degree you know, as part of this investigation. Um, they have gotten a lot of data now. Um, I've seen a bit of it. It's very intriguing. Um, I will let Martin, uh, you know, publish out what he's planning on publishing out. The The data will be made available to ARIS um, and uh, anyone that wants to look at it. We're looking at trying to get it on a on a website that is public so people could uh, download this information once we we're able to, uh, to make sure we've got all of the uh, metadata there so that, you know, people aren't having to ask 10 million questions about what, what all this represents. Um, and, and um, the intent is that once this experiment is over, which should be the end of February, they'll be stowed away for a, a little bit, primarily because the, uh, the um, Astro Pi, the Raspberry Pi we're using, needs to be used for a, another student experiment, ESA student experiment. But um, our intent is uh, to utilize this again in the future and... Uh, you know, to get some proposals of potential experiments. So it's it's a pretty interesting capability, and uh, we're pretty excited about it. And um, and and Martin Busher is going to continue to work with us on this thing. So it's a very interesting partnership. It's a great research project, and um, it could be a, a great resource for the ham community. All right, we're going to switch gears from hardware over to uh, o- over to the to, to all the red tape. And uh, in November, uh, we had a possibility um, that the space station wouldn't have a crew because the rocket launch in Russia failed, and the expiration date on the return vehicle was looming, and we weren't sure what was going to happen with Eris during that time. And uh, thankfully, they got a new crew up there in time, but um, I'm sure it brought up a lot of discussion and planning for what would happen if and when this happened, and it may happen again. So can you tell us a little bit about maybe what to expect if that ever would happen? Well, let me, let me, let me start with, um, you know, we're, we, and when I say we, the international community is going through a transition right now. And uh, a hunk of that transition is happening in the United States. And that has to do with the fact that, I mean, everybody knows that um, NASA retired the space shuttle in um, 2011. And we're on the cusp of being able to uh, fly um, astronauts through a commercial, uh, ve- through commercial vehicles. Um, you know, the two main ones are, uh, are the SpaceX... Um, Dragon vehicle and uh, the the Boeing um, uh, crew capsule also, and so um, those are being ready to fly. Um, hopefully this year, uh, and that's a little bit of the the I'll say the rub, if you will, is going on right now. Is it because any new project always runs into delays? I don't care, you know, it's a, it's a if it's a, a space flight project, and, a, and it doesn't matter whose it is, industry, NASA, or whatever, they always run into delays. It's not clear when exactly those flights will happen. And so um, 
you know, this the problem. There are going to be situations where um, a vehicle doesn't go as planned, and and thank goodness, um, you know, the two astronauts, uh, the the cosmonaut and astronaut that was on board, um, Nick Hague on the on the astronaut side, um, everything went. It didn't go as planned. But the abort system went exactly as planned, and the the, the individuals were safe. Um, there, basically, NASA and Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, uh, worked through the concerns that went along with that, and were able to to to, to uh, um, fly another set of crew, uh, you know, fairly soon after that, and they didn't have a situation where. You know, where the uh, space station was had no crew on board. All the internationally, everyone wants to not have the the space station without a crew on it, and that is an important piece here. And how that gets worked is, um, I'll say, beyond my pay grade because I don't <laughs> work on that anymore. But what I can tell you, because of course I had some insight being working at NASA, is that. You know, there are opportunities where they can extend the crew. I mean, they can. You mentioned an expiration date. Well, you know, ec- there's margin in some of these things, and extending out longer is is an option. And so that's just one of the many options they're looking at. But the most important thing, and I'm going to go back to what I started with, is we need to have a diverse set and robust set of vehicles to fly because there's going to be a problem here and there. And unfortunately, um, we are down to one vehicle that's Soyuz only. And, um, and Soyuz is a phenomenal vehicle. But we all need to have this diversity of, of, of vehicles. And, and that's why NASA, when it started the commercial crew program, they didn't want to have one vehicle. They wanted to have at least two. And there's others out there that might make it three or four in the future. But at least two that could go into orbit and and and, uh, and dock with space station. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so hopefully it doesn't happen. <laughs> well, yes, of course. We we don't want that to. We wouldn't don't do not want that to happen. Um, how it would have. And so you asked about how it would impact Eris. Well. You know, Eris is primarily a crew tended capability. We're trying to change that. That's that's a future thing too. Um, in that, you know, to be able to command directly to our, our station and, and, and do things like that. But our, our station is primarily a crew tended activity. So, you know, if the crew's not there, they're not gonna do do contacts. So um, and and um, you know, whether we kept APRS on or not, that's a that's a probably would have to shut it down because we don't have the ability to turn it off, you know, automatic, you know, um, remotely, I'll say. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, we are running behind, but we've got so much to talk about. So that's, uh, that's all right. But when we come back, we're going to talk about bees in space. So we'll talk about that and, and, and figure that out right after this word from ICOM America right here on ham talk live attention all hams icom knows that ham clubs play a big role in bringing ham communities together to learn from their peers and industry leaders as a way to give back and help you on this mission icom has launched a promotion exclusively for ham clubs and the ham fest they are involved with by registering your club you could win icom swag a skype presentation or for your ham fest an icom booth set up at your ham club register today for your chance to win enter today at www.icomamerica.com slash hams ham fest net registration is open to u.s organizations only join the conversation give us a call at 812 net ham one that's 812-638-4261 now here's more ham talk live We're not sure what's up with the fifth dentist, but four out of five dentists recommend listening to Ham Talk Live.
Thanks to ICOM America for sponsoring Ham Talk Live once again. We're on the air every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time live right here at hamtalklive.com. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, we'll take your calls here shortly. If you have a question for Frank, give us a call at 812-650-9556. Again, uh, the temporary number is 812-650-9556. If you have a question or you can tweet us at Ham Talk Live. And if you're listening to us on the podcast edition or on WTWW, uh, you won't be able to reach us live since uh, this show was on Thursday. So uh, we'll get some questions in here. But before we do that, I, I've got a couple already waiting. But uh, before we do that, we want to talk about these bees in space. So they're astro bees. Tell us about that and how ham radio may tie into it. Sure, Neil. Um, yeah, Astro B is a uh, set of robotic systems that are going to be operating on space station, um, being coordinated through the Ames Research Center. And um, uh, right now, there are some robotic uh, uh, vehicles. They're called Spheres, um, and and um, Casus, the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. Um, has a program uh, called First, or, I'm sorry, Zero Robotics, where actually students um, uh, do competition with these sphere, spheres, um, uh, satellites, if you will. They're satellites inside the space station. Um, the Astro Bees are supposed to be like that, but more companions to the crew. In other words, uh, being able to do different things for the crew members. Um, we're starting to see robots in stores and things like that now. Um, you know, uh, internal the space station. You know, being a uh, and then of course we got Alexa and Siri and things like that. Um, having something like that on space stations is important, um, uh, and so that's what the primary purpose of these Astro B uh, robots are. Now, um, the interesting thing uh, when you Spheres could only be in one module, whereas these Astro B um, robots, which are you know about the size of a little bit bigger than a CubeSat, okay, for those that understand, you know how big a CubeSat is, um, what uh, they can do is they can propel themselves into different modules. So if they can come into this Columbus module, which is the case. Um, you know, there could be an opportunity where ham radio and these astrobees communicate with one another, and uh, we, we do some different things with them. And so we've been in some preliminary discussions with some of the folks at Ames and in Casis about these ideas, and, and um, uh, we're, you know, all I can say is stay tuned. We've got some meetings later this year, so this is not going to happen this year, but maybe next year or the year after, not sure yet. And it all is a function of, you know, whether we can come up with an, uh, a, an agreement uh, that suits everybody. But that's pretty much the idea. And it's, it's a pretty cool little device, um, you know, and it has capabilities, communication capabilities that we can leverage off of. All right. It's, it it sounds pretty cool. Uh, some of the things that you could actually, you know, do by you know you could control it and it'll respond somehow, and and that's that's pretty cool that you'd be able to to do that up in the space station. So hopefully that will all pan out. Well, let's get to some of these uh, questions here. Uh, first off, uh, Jim Wilson K five N D sent us a question. Uh, he wants to know when will approved Aris contacts for the second half of 2019 be announced? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, we um, are running a little longer than normal this year. Um, but uh, let me just say that we are on the cusp of making the announcement. Uh, I can't, uh, what we've publicly said is that before the end of the, um, uh, uh, sorry, by 
around the 1st of February, we would be making the announcement. Well, we're getting awful close to the 1st of February. Uh, and um, I would say with... Yeah, I would say within the week we will make announcements on that. So uh, that's probably stay the best tuned. thing for me to say. <laughs> yeah, so stay again, tuned. stay tuned, but it won't be too long. So Yeah. Okay, very good. And then uh, Kevin Zary, KK4YEL, wrote in about uh, some NASA on the air things and says, uh, how cool was it to work with the NASA on the air group and and hams around the globe were excited to receive those slow scan images and so uh tell us about uh the potential for uh retransmission of those images okay well let me just first say nasa on the air has been a really cool program i um i I really applaud the whole team on what they've done uh we are trying to do our part eris is trying to do our part and help them uh, enable them uh, to continue um, describing uh, the legacy or, or the history of NASA. And so um, in this, we're going to have a slow scan television event um, that will have several images from uh, the NODAF team, the NASA on the air team, uh, as well as um, some specific historic items associated with amateur radio in space. And so um, that is going to occur uh, February 8th to February 10th. So we're talking a little little more than a week away. Uh, you will There will be a press release. Uh, it's, it's literally being worked uh, as, as we speak here. Um, the plan is uh, that we will use the similar uh, mode, SSTV mode, that we've been using in the past, which has been PD-120. And um, my understanding is we would expect this to start on February 8th around 1825 UTC. So um, it should be very interesting. I think uh, we've got eight um, NODA images and um, a four uh, human spaceflight um, amateur radio images in there. And so uh, I think people will, uh, will enjoy that. All right, so that's coming up, and, and and you got to work with somebody really cool like Kevin Zary. Yeah, uh, <laughs> give a sh- I'll give a shout out to Kevin. I appreciate him and uh, and and Scott and uh, and, and Rob Suggs. Uh, all all have been uh, working with us pretty closely on the SSTV activities. All right. Well, we had to we had to get Kevin in there, but uh, you know the images. Uh, there were some issues, and, and you know working through those, and and so that'll be a great chance to uh, to try to catch those again. Um, we've got some greetings from uh, John in for JTK from warm Orlando, Florida. So thanks for listening, John and JD JJ one NJM says good morning from japan so we we've got an international audience here about the uh, international space station so uh, if you have a question give us a call that phone number is 812-650-9556 we have frank on here for a few more minutes tonight so give us a call 812-650-9556 is the number to call uh, for this evening, and we'll uh, keep going here. Uh, I've got a tweet from Patrick, WD9EWK, says, nice to hear Frank on, and glad to hear the crew uh, located that replacement packet module and uh, is hoping that can get back on the air soon. So I, I guess I don't feel quite so bad now if I if I lose my keys. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they lost the packet module. They found it. They so found there's hope. It. it was it was lost and has now been found. Um, I will tell you. I gotta I gotta say uh, uh, some real kudos. Uh, of course, go to uh, our Aris team uh, and and getting that packet module done quickly. Also, our uh, payload integration manager uh, Juliet Sang really worked hard to make sure we got on the the uh, the progress flight um, when we did because we were trying to get it up there as quickly as possible so uh you know we turned that around in just a couple months and that's pretty pretty cool if you think about it oh yeah yeah a couple of months for uh 
for the red tape uh, alone is uh, is pretty amazing. So very good stuff. All right. Well, uh, well let's take one more uh, standby here for calls at 812-650-9556. Or uh, you can tweet us. We've got several of those coming in tonight. So uh, let us know what your questions are here while we have Frank before he takes off yet again in the morning. Uh, he, 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 I think he's busier than I am, which is kind of scary. Um Let's see, you know, we had this big, uh, we hosted here in the, I say we, the United States, uh, the International uh, Aris Conference this year, and um, I know I know that cool dude Kevin Zeri was there too. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. I know there was a whole lot going on and, and we don't have, you know, a lot of time, but uh, tell us a little bit about hosting that and, and some of the things that happened here this summer. Okay. Yeah, I can. I mean, one thing I want to say, um, because we did do this uh, both at the MSET meeting as well as uh, at the ARIS meeting in College Park, Maryland. Um, it was great to have uh, Serena, you know, on the air. And she got on and, and said a few words to some of the folks at the ARIS meeting as well as at the MSET meeting and to hams all over the world. It was phenomenal to see that um, we haven't had too many astronauts uh, get on the air and that was great um, the the Aris meeting went very well um, we had uh, individuals of course from all over the world and um, and then another thing we did was we had um, an education summit so let me talk a little bit about the the Aris meeting one of the things we're working on um, a project that uh, we're working on is looking at um, the Deep Space Gateway, which is the next project in human spaceflight, which is to um, actually bring people uh, around the vicinity of the moon. And um, we've been, uh, we had someone from NASA present on Gateway, very interested, they're very interested in us. Um, being involved from an education perspective, from an amateur radio perspective. Uh, so um, so we're working that. We've got an exploration team that, uh, Aris has an exploration team that's looking at what kind of antennas we need and radios, and both on the ground and in space. Uh, so that was an interesting piece of the Aris meeting that we had. Of course, we talked about the hardware systems, the interoperable radio system, which well, also, I didn't say this, but we'll have a, a voice repeater on there, too. So, I, you know, uh, we'll have packet, we'll have voice repeater, and all kinds of things like that. And then we had this education summit, which um, was the first time we've ever done it. We brought in educators from our education committee uh, within ARIS, as well as educators from around uh, uh, the vicinity of uh, Maryland, and also our two major our um, our two uh, organizations that provide funding for us um, CASIS, the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space and NASA NASA's Space Communication Navigation Organization so they came in brought in all kinds of education ideas the idea of the education summit was to get our educators better to better understand what's going on in ARIS because they attended the ARIS meeting What's going on relative to uh, amongst themselves to improve our overall education outcomes that, that we do with ARIS? The more these teachers that, that have had an ARIS contact can convey to other teachers what it's like and some of the pitfalls and the positives, um, that just provides a better opportunity every time we do these. So... All in all, of course, I'm biased, but all in all, we had a really good we had a really good set of sessions, both internationally uh, with the Aris meeting as well as uh, you know with the education summit. Yeah, I've heard uh, heard all kinds of good comments about both, and uh, so I, I think while you may be biased, I, I think you're still accurate. So. That's uh, that's some good stuff, and and we've got more uh, school contacts coming up, and and, and Jim 
uh, K5ND says uh, he's got his uh, fingers crossed for the, um, let's see, which one was it? It was a scouting event, and I scrolled down the page. Uh, World Jamboree, yes, World Jamboree, fingers crossed for that. So we'll we'll know soon. So Yes, we will know cool. soon. <laughs> be cool. I can't divulge anything positive or negative. <laughs> All right. Well, Frank, I know you've got to catch a flight in the morning, so uh, we will get you out of here on time. But uh, thanks so much for coming back on the show again to update us as we do uh, from time to time and all kinds of cool uh, projects, uh, both hardware and, and human stuff going on. And uh, appreciate your time and uh, have a good flight and uh we'll uh we'll catch you on here next time and, and and talk more about it okay neil well thank you very much for having the opportunity to share what's going on in eris um as you can hear there's a lot of interesting and exciting things across operations across hardware development across education um and and i just you know say one more time you know we're trying to build these hardware systems right now and and keep this program going and any kind of donations anybody can provide um through the eris.org website at the donate button would be very much appreciated and if you donate over at amsat it's 100 uh, percent going over to uh the eris as long as you click on that eris donate button so uh, i would love to uh see that uh, be taken care of so that way uh that can get going, and and maybe this year that sounds like a a, a great opportunity and uh, and a great timeline if that can actually get pulled off by the end of the year. All right, well, thanks, Frank. Uh, appreciate it, and um, that is a wrap for this week's edition of Ham Talk Live. Thanks to Frank Bauer, KA three HDO, and everyone out there in cyberspace for listening and typing in tonight. And uh, invite you back next Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Craig Thompson, K9CT, and Joe Fitter, K7JOE, will be here to talk about the North American Collegiate Championships. And for a list of all of our upcoming guests, be sure to visit HamTalkLive.com. A couple of quick announcements. The Stewart, Florida Ham Fest is coming up March 16th at 8 a.m. And it's free. You can check that out at StuartHam.com. That's S-T-U. U-A-R-T-HAM.com. And also, the AM Rally starts tomorrow. So uh, don't forget about the AM Rally. That's amrally.com for the information on that. So that's this weekend. So get out there and, and hit that AM button and give that a shot. And uh, if you like Ham Talk Live, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. It helps others find us faster. So for now, this is Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, saying 7375, and may the good DX be yours. Now, 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 now